I'll make the, the introduction of uh, Jock and Inga short because uh, you'll want to get straight into our discussion. Jock's books are The Rules of Backyard Cricket, uh, and this is not in any particular order. Uh, the Rules of Backyard Cricket on the Java Ridge, Quota, Preservation, The Burning Island, The Settlement, and as editor, um, Jock has edited The Great Ocean Quarterly, um, and the book Lines to the Horizon, Australian Surf Writing. Uh, Inga's books, um, not that it's any competition, uh, are <laughs> The Last Woman in the World, The Book of Australian Trees, Where the Trees Were, Mr Wig, Nests, Understory and Willow Man. Um, uh, first of all, could you please welcome Jock Sverong and Inga Simpson. <laughs> Um, Inga, I'm wondering if you could uh, set some ground rules, if you like, for our, for our prize fight and um, introduce Willow Man uh, to the audience um, and uh, we'll take it from there. Okay, thanks Marco. Uh, so Willow Man has, there's two storylines. One is a traditional bat maker and um, called Alan Reader, uh, who also was an oboist. Um, so a classical musician now making cricket bats from White Willow. He makes a particular bat for a particular player, uh, Todd Harrow, an up-and-coming young opening batsman. And, um, yeah, they, there's kind of a connection between the two through that bat. And Todd Harrow has a, a younger sister, Liv, who is equally as talented. I'll leave it there. Um, and can I just see a show of hands who, who's read Willow Man? Okay, so we've got uh, we've got a good a good chunk of the <laughs> of the audience. Oh, I've read it too. Um, uh, it was sent to me, Inga, by uh, as you know, by um, your publisher uh, for a kind of you know so-called expert read. And um, y you know, I could I could nitpick with a few things about the cricket, but absolutely nothing about the art of bat of bat making of cricket bat making. You are you are well ahead of me and uh, I think uh, well ahead of, of everybody um, on that and uh, it's 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 a joy to read and the book has been uh, extremely successful in the um, nearly a year since it was published. Um, Jock, uh, you're, you, you've been put on the program as a writer about surfing so let's let's uh, limit you first of all to, to surfing and uh, could you tell the audience a little bit about the, the writing on surfing that you've either done or, or edited? Yeah, um, okay. Uh, I, I had been practicing as a lawyer for years and years and I was very frustrated because I wanted to write and um, the way into, I could, the only way I could think of to get into writing of any kind was that the guy I surfed with all the time ran this little surfing magazine and I think I nervously said to him one day, could I write a story for you? And that led to other stories for him and then other surfing magazines and then we published Great Ocean Quarterly, which is not a surf mag but a ma about um, creative people and their responses to the ocean, I suppose. Um, and the great thing, particularly about writing for Surfing World, which I'm still doing, um, was that they never really put any demands on me about writing about the tour or writing about products or writing about the kind of dull commercial stuff that I had no interest in. Um, right from the very start, I was doing these big 5,000, 6,000 word pieces about weird things that were important to me, um, like about mental health and about the indigenous country that is the places where we surf and um, about the biology of corals and the things that perhaps surfers don't think about in going about their surfing lives. And so I was really fortunate that there was this editor at Surfing World at the time, who's a guy called Vaughan Blakey, who encouraged me to go off on those excursions and printed them. I don't think he even edited them. <laughs> um, so yeah, that gave me a chance to, to really explore a, a human side of the sport. Um, you're both... Uh wonderful nature writers and and this is um not necessarily in uh the the sport realm but in your in your other writing where, where you've written um completely separate from sport and i'm just wondering about the the way nature interacts with sport in in your writing they're they're both you're not writing about darts uh and you're not writing about billiards uh sports which are which are kind of 
man-made creations that shut nature out. Um, you've written about sports that let nature in. I'm wondering if you'd like to talk about that a little. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as someone who loves trees and birds and outdoor settings, yeah, most of my work sort of comes out of the landscape. And that was my way in with Willow Man too. I knew I wanted to write a cricket novel. I knew I had, I had um, things to say about the game. But yeah, it was really reading about the properties of white willow, which all elite cricket bats are made from, this one species, kind of a subspecies really of white willow. It was reading about that and the almost magical qualities of that timber that, that gave me my way into the book. And, and that is, you know, willow is the heart of the book. Um, you know, this is a timber that starts out uh, as a softwood, you know, like balsa, you know, quite um, wet and, and soft. But, yeah, in the hands of a bat maker, it's, it's shaped and compressed so, such that it's a hardwood, you know, hard enough to hit a, a cricket ball. Um, but I still struggled with this book, particularly the, the cricket scenes, the test matches, until I realised, as you say, they're outside. And cricket grounds are often very um, beautiful and have trees in the grounds and, you know, it, um, some small grounds, including one that I lived quite close to when I started writing the book. There are actually trees in the ground. <laughs> so that became a way for me to focus the story and, and ground myself, as it were. And each of the overseas locations that um, the players play at, that, are, you know, I've set some scenes in... Um, you know, I even have my player focusing on the tree, you know, at the, um, on the edge of the ground or, um, you know, if you think of Cape Town in South Africa, you know, the mountain looming up over the ground. So bringing the natural world into the, into the game and, yeah, absolutely, it's um, a game dependent on the conditions too, you know, the weather. So, yeah, it... Uh, it was a perfect sport for me to write about. Yeah, definitely not darts. <laughs> do, do you think um, cricket is a game of, uh, you know, mastering nature, countering nature, or one of riding with nature? That's a good question. Um, I think certainly as a player, um, you know, then the game is kind of trying to master... So a cricket pitch is, you know, highly manicured, isn't it? Um, curated, um, pressed, compressed and, and mowed and so on. But, yeah, I think to be successful as a player, you have to go with the conditions, don't you? You know, the natural conditions and, and adapt um, to those changing conditions between matches, between days sometimes, depending where you're playing. Yeah, well, that's an interesting question. And if you think of it in terms of bat making... Yeah, I mean, I managed to bring an environmental thread into the, the novel because I, I just thought, oh, how vulnerable is this sport that's dependent on this one species of tree? Um, and most of it has grown in England and a couple of um, counties. So, yeah, imagine if something happened to that tree. But certainly England is trying to control um, the product, as it were, of, of white willow. Uh, so, yeah, I wonder how long that can last. Um, Jock, it's probably stating the obvious to, to say that surfing is a pursuit that is trying to ride with nature. Um, maybe you'd like to explain to the audience about something else that, that's happening. And um, uh, last week we saw uh, an elite world surf tour event um, that is uh, an attempt in a way to eliminate nature. Yeah, I'm so glad you raised that because I was just thinking about that. Um, so the, the World Surfing Tour stops at, depending on the year, 11 or 12 venues around the world. And um, the last few years they've had a tournament, an event in California in a wave pool. And there are, there's a wave pool in Tullamarine in Melbourne, there's one in Yapoon in Queensland. Um, th there's various different technologies that produce the wave and the wave is supposed to be perfect. Um, I, I, I don't know about you, but I tuned in to the, the wave pool event for about 15 minutes. And I thought, you're kidding me, this is, <laughs> it's a different sport. Um, I think culturally surfers have 
been trying for years now, it wasn't initially the case, but they've been trying for years to eliminate the natural vari variability in surfing um, through the use of jet skis, um, through the use of buoyancy devices, through creating wave pools. It's all about trying to give the human mastery over the, the random. And, and it's amazing how much of the joy of the experience that sucks away um, once you start doing that. And, and I, you know, an interesting example of this, when I was writing for Surfing World, there was a huge swell that emerged out of the Antarctic. And so it started on the Ross Ice Shelf. And forecasting is such now that it can be tracked and measured and forecast very, very precisely. So uh, a filmmaker and a surf company got together they got three elite surfers and they did this experiment where they followed the swell all the way from um, Australia, New Zealand, across the Pacific to Tahiti, then all the way around Mexico and North America until the swell finally died somewhere up near the Aleutian Islands. And they, these surfers were getting on and off planes the whole time surfing it, then desperately racing back to the airport and getting on a plane to beat the swell to the next place and then do it again. And the filmmaker made this film. And it was kind of fascinating. And I was asked to write up that filmmaking experience. And you could talk about planes and you could talk about cars and you could talk about the amount of boards they were carrying. Um, but the most interesting thing in the end that there was this tiny little migratory bird that was some kind of tern, which migrates around exactly the same route that they were following. And I was thinking of the belly of the plane and this tiny little bird out there in the storm, you know, doing the same thing. So you can either choose to turn your mind towards the human mastery of it, um, which I think is just complete nonsense because the forces are enormous, um, or you can try and bring your mind back towards the tiny things. And maybe that's one of the things that happens as you get older, that you start to, because you have less of an ability to dominate anything, um, you start to think more about the natural part of it. Um, ha have you surfed any of the artificial wave pools? Yeah, I've surfed Tullamarine a few times, um, mostly to take my son because he loves it, and I d I d it leaves me cold. Um, it, it doesn't behave like a wave. I think the Californian one behaves more like a wave. The, the Melbourne one feels very artificial. Um, it's, it's an what do you mean by that, behaving like a wave? Yeah, OK, so if, you, if you're surfing a hollow wave at a beach here, um, you're watching the lip of the wave just above your eye line and, and once the face starts to hollow and the lip starts to pitch, you know that you're, you're looking for a barrel. The pool doesn't do that. It, the barrel comes from in front of you towards you and you duck your head so it doesn't hit you in the face, um, which it often does. So um, that, that, I guess, is an example of those kind of artificial physics. It comes out of a hole in the wall, so you're sitting in the corner of a triangle and you have to be very careful not to bang your board or yourself on the walls and all of a sudden the water drops and you're being projected into a wave, which is not at all how the ocean behaves. You see the thing coming. And why does your son like it? Sorry. Why does your son like it? Uh, because I think kids will dig any experience that feels like it's been fed to them well in a marketing sense. Um, so of our four kids, two of them surf, and um, my oldest daughter surfs, and she and I will sit out the back and we'll talk about life and death, and waves will just roll under us the whole time. And we have these beautiful conversations that we never have on land. Um, when I surf with my son, he just motors off looking for waves and you can hear him grunting. <laughs> he'll be yelling at his mates and he'll be pushing turns and it's a whole different mindset. And maybe that's boys and girls, I don't know. But um, yeah, they love the hype of it, I think. We'll get to, to more talk about surfing as a sport, um, but isn't another thing, and I'm speaking from my own experience, that the, the randomness of nature in what is a very competitive pursuit, if you're in the water in a pack of, in my case, mostly younger people, uh, the randomness of nature's waves gives you a chance. Yes, and this was always the interesting thing about Kelly Slater's career, that it, it's less the case now, but so many times th there'd be a 20 minute heat and he'd be behind the whole way and at the 19 and a half minute mark a wave would come precisely to him and the other person would sit there going I can't believe that's happened again and it became this real thing where people believed he had some ability to summon that wave um, <laughs> and I mean, he's a fabulous athlete in so many other respects and it was nonsense that started to play on people's minds but it, it underlines the point that you have elite athletes and precision equipment 
pitted against something that's entirely random. And that's the fun of it. And once you take that out, I don't know why you'd watch it. Um, Inga, I guess the, the equivalent in cricket would be, would be indoor cricket. Um, uh, and also when kids are raised on cricket, they're raised on artificial um, uh, wickets. Uh, what, what, what do you think of that as a, a sport? What, what about its connection to cricket played in nature? I mean, it gets kids playing, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, I had yeah, no interest in that part of the game. Um, though my player, yeah, um, emerging, growing up on a, a rural ground, yeah, had an artificial pitch. So, yeah, that, even that, I couldn't get out of there quick enough in terms of the writing of those scenes, you know, um, because it, it lacked those variables. But that, that small country ground did have um, the variable of this big old fig tree in it, and so you know that was fun to play with. But yeah, I mean, I guess the, any way that brings young people to the sport is good, and maybe extending the season isn't that what part of it's about too? Um, it's such a limited season, in, even in Australia. But yeah, no, I, I'm more interested in this um, this artificial wave. I hadn't thought about that, of the the feel of it, and and yeah, not being able to sit out the back and relax. It's entirely joyless. <laughs> yeah, that's the best bit. <laughs> Looking around at the birds. You get minutes, don't you? This is just got to go back to the artificial wave. If you're going to Tullamarine, you get a slot of minutes and the waves come out of the machine and you have to get your wave. Otherwise, you go back to the end of the queue. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And um, they, they can change the setting during your session. So it's an hour and you get 18 waves. I mean, how ridiculous. You could sit out here for an hour and get two. <laughs> and um, I, the last time I went, it was set to backhand barrels. And I was thinking to myself, OK, I know I get six barrel waves. And I got through all six of them. And I was congratulating myself on, on how well I'd done. And then they send you the photographs afterwards. And all six of them, I was eight feet out in front of the barrel. You know, sort of styling away, nowhere near the barrel. It sounds like a computer game. Um, Inga, with Willow Man, um, you wouldn't write a novel unless you were providing a, a counter narrative to, to what you see in, in cricket. And I had my own ideas about this, but I, I wonder what, what you intended and what you felt as you were writing was the counter narrative that you are providing and what was it countering? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a tough question, actually. My motivation for writing the book changed um, as I went on. The more I researched, the more I watched the game whilst thinking about the book, if that makes sense. I mean, initially, I really just um, was emotional about Philip Hughes, um, Philip Hughes's death, and so part of cricket player trajectory anyway. So I knew about bat making and um, had a strong sense of the storyline I wanted for the bat maker, Alan Reader, for um, the focus on his craft and that he would make a kind of a magic bat, if you like, for a particular player and that he would be a musician. You know, I had a lot of that, but what to say about the game? I mean, there's so much to say. So initially, probably, I just wanted to maybe write the career that Philip Hughes should have had, you know, that I felt, um, you know, he, he missed out on having and that we missed out on seeing. But then I started to, you know, turn the kind of more critical eye to the game and um, I quite deliberately said it at the emergence, at the point of emergence of the T20, the really short form of the game. Uh, because there was talk, of course, that this would be the end of cricket, the end of test cricket and... Uh, no one would watch that anymore and it would be the end of traditional bat making uh, because everyone wanted big, heavy bats that would just hit the ball to the boundary. And of course at that time there was kind of a, a byproduct of T20 cricket which was the re-emergence of women's cricket. And um, in the middle of writing too there was Sandpaper Gate so, yeah, the more I got into it, the more I got into writing, the more I found I wanted to say about the game. So I guess the main, the main counter-narrative is probably um, the sibling rivalry between 
the two, um, Todd and Liv, and the different trajectories their careers take, or put differently, the different opportunities um, for males playing cricket at that time and, and females. And something that I'd seen, um, a difference in how they played the game. There was a, a picture, and it was probably on the front page of one of the papers, when the uh, women won the One Day Cricket World Cup. And just the joy on their faces. Um, they were just so, yeah, it was a picture I had up as like a motivational thing for life, you know, just the joy of achieving that goal together as a team. And they played the game in a better spirit. And certainly once Sandpaper Gate happened and kind of uh, Cricket Australia turned their attention to the women's game quite cleverly, I thought, to divert attention <laughs> from the badly behaved men. And there's a lovely book out, um, came out last year by Marion Stell about body line and women's cricket, where the same approach was taken, that a body line had become pretty much an international incident between Australia and England. And um, suddenly all this attention and a little bit of money was put into women, the women's game because yeah, that was seen as very um, properly played and in a, in a good spirit and a good publicity kind of juggernaut. So it was interesting how that happened. But, yeah, I wanted to highlight the kind of entitlement that had crept into the, to the men's game and um, the different trajectory available for women and how that changed, you know, even during the time that I was writing the book, how that changed, but certainly in the timeline... Of, uh, of Willow Man and maybe unpacking that a little bit further, you know, what is success? You know, what is it to be successful? What does that mean? And as, you know, a creative person, there was actually a surprising amount um, that I found, you know, that I felt in, to be in common with being an elite sports person, you know, and... Um, what you're striving for versus what you achieve and uh, what is satisfying versus as you get there, you know, perhaps it's less satisfying than you thought it might be, you know, those kind of ideas. And what we as uh, viewers, as readers or um, listeners or observers or, you know, followers of the game, I found that really interesting too about how, how we can really get excited about a new upcoming player but the minute they're out of form or misbehave or, you know, have a few failures, how quickly the public turns and the press can turn on a player and how, uh, what that says about us uh, as a nation, um, as people, you know, why do we expect so much from our sports people and why was I and, and plenty of people who don't even watch cricket so upset about a young man dying on the cricket pitch. Yeah. Um, gosh, there's a, there's a lot to there's a lot to to, to talk about in there. Um, on on women's sport, uh, women's elite sport and men's elite sport. Um, I'm going to ask you to look into the future. Um, perhaps equality in the minds of participants and. Um, uh, spectators we see in the Olympic Games. Gold is gold. Uh, I think Australia is, uh, every country is cheering for their women in exactly the same way uh, as they cheer for their men. The um, level of performance of women's sport seems to be just as joyless as uh, male sport. Um, with professionalisation in a sport like cricket or, or football or all of the the, the sports where women are, you know, going ahead in leaps and bounds. In the future, as professionalisation increases, do you see that joy remaining? I hope so. But, yeah, you're right. As there's more pressure, more money. Um, you know, it was interesting, Ashley Gardner, Australian women's player, who um, got the biggest kind of pay offer to play in the Indian Premier League, it was interesting that it looked like the pressure was getting to her of just that being paid proper money was changing her game, but then she kind of came good. So, yeah, I guess with more money, with professionalisation, comes more pressure um, and maybe more competition with each other for spots. 
So maybe, uh, but I do think there's a different culture in the in cricket anyway. I don't follow uh, women's AFL, but yeah, I mean I'm sure there will be shifts, but hopefully not. Yeah, not to it's the same extent. That, um, it, it, at the moment, women's AFL is going through a collective bargaining agreement, and um, there are players making the point that they're right in the worst possible spot, which is it's no longer an amateur sport. It's, it's not yet a fully professionalised sport. So you've got athletes who are holding down a day job and having to operate at this elite level. So it's the worst of all worlds, which I guess is where male players were 30, 40, 50 years ago, where they'd, they'd go and do a day job and then turn up to training. Um, and it means that the money isn't great, the time demands are enormous, and, and I wonder if that impacts on the kind of the joy of it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so being freed up to play sport full time, their sport full time, is a huge step, isn't it? It takes pressure off, but then, then these other pressures come in. It's so interesting what happens with success. I think the biggest issue for women's cricket is, you know, will they ever get to play enough test matches? Yeah, but to play, I know, yeah, that would be the, the dream of most women players as, as much as it is the men. Um, and yeah, they're not, well, there's a question about how much test cricket there'll be for men too, but that the women won't even get that, like a multi-test series, you know, we, will we ever even see that? Um, Jock, just a question for you with, with the uh, interconnections between women's sport and men's sport. Your, your football club, Collingwood, um, was associated with a women's netball team until recently. What, what, and, and now they've cut that, or they've, they've announced an intention to cut that. What's going on there? Yeah, I don't know the ins and outs of it commercially, but um, it's interesting, isn't it, that a football club becomes a, a kind of a franchise of products, or a, a franchise offering products, and that the netball was simply one in a suite of things that the, the Collingwood entity could offer to the public, um, and that at a point when that became uncommercial, they simply cut away the, the unprofitable product, um, which probably goes to illustrate the commercial brutality of it all, that on one level it looks like empowerment and equality, and on another level it's simply um, shifting products around the shelf. Um, moving on to writing specifically, and, and, and fiction writing, because this is, this is a, a really interesting, ongoing question for, for, for me. Um, you listen to surfers, you listen to cricketers, you listen to all people who play sport, and they're they're natural storytellers. That, that's what they're doing during, after, before um, they're, they're, you know, they're playing of the, of the sport. And they're even fictionless. The, the, the stories you hear um, contain as much fiction as, as fact. Um, what is the barrier between that and you know, getting people to write to, to commit to the page, to commit to a different art form. Yeah, oh, well, I, I don't know if this answers that or not, but I'm fascinated by the way that management speak has crept into athlete speak. Um, I, I, I can't get enough of watching a footballer talk about transparently executing the plan. <laughs> so, I, I had this, I, I, this very close friend all the way through my childhood and, and all the way up to now who um, is not only a very, very gifted lawyer. He was a very, very gifted amateur footballer and he um, got to, I reckon about 22, there was no injury trouble, he was at the peak of his career and then one day he just stopped playing football and um, I thought that was great because we could go surfing more but years later I said to him, what happened? And he said, I had this moment where I was standing there on the ground and I looked around at them all and I thought, we're chasing a ball. <laughs> And once you have that realisation, <laughs> you can never go back. <laughs> and that's not executing a plan transparently. Damn you, Jock, I hadn't thought of that. Um, Ingra, I wonder if, if you could I expand on this. There's been, a, I think, a historic thing in Australia that, that has been stronger in Australia than in other English-speaking countries an idea that we grew up with, which was that you could be interested in arts, you could be interested in sport, but you couldn't be interested in both. Oh yeah, this writing Willow Man really brought that out. Um, gosh, I, um, and I was writing it for a long time, so I'd go to a dinner party or whatever, and it'd be people I knew and some people I didn't or didn't know as well, and, oh, what are you working on? And I'd say, oh, a cricket book. 
cricket. Why would you write a cricket? And then they'd go on this tirade about the game and how you could five days and no result. I'm like, and those are some of the best games. They're fantastic. No. And, um, oh, and they get paid so much. And, you know, so this real cultural cringe against sport. So, yeah, I came up against that a lot. Um, I mean, yeah, I've been talking to a few people at this festival and um, the person I'm thinking of has gone home now, so I think it's safe to say, oh, I just hate sport. I'm sorry I haven't read it, but I just hate sport. And I'm like, but I wrote it. Like, <laughs> you like my books. Trust me. Just trust me. So, yeah, definitely there is that, you know, among sports people that might, oh, I don't read. No, I wouldn't pick up a book or whatever. I think the current men's captain, Pat Cummins, is quite a reader, so... Um, but I'm yet to hear from him about Willow Man. Um, <laughs> yeah, so definitely, and that never they should meet, but it's, you know, such a big part of Australian culture, it's sort of crazy not to talk about it, and it does reflect on us, reflect our society and how, how the society is changing over time. So, um, you know, people are... I mean, I basically came out again, all over again as a um, cricket fanatic. You know, no one, there are pl plenty of people who didn't know. So that's been, you know, oh, I'm writing a cricket novel. Um, yeah, finding that I'm newly shy and plenty of people are shocked. But once I start talking about White Willow, oh, there's trees in it. I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> there's trees in it. Um, it is strange and um, I wonder why. I mean, you might have have a sense of why. Why do they be separate? I remember when Rules of Backyard Cricket came out that people would come up to me and they'd say, is this a cricket book? I hate cricket books. Yeah. And I'd say, no, 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 it's a book about brothers. It's a book about relationships. Yeah. It's a book about the toxic influence of the sporting media. Yeah, oh, okay, I'll give that a crack. And then other people, typically blokes, would come up to you and say, is this a cricket book? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, mate. One of the best things about writing Willow Man has been, and you write like so much stories around the game, you know, that it's just incredible. I have never had so many emails from men. Um, women too, but, yeah, so women too, but more men who don't. Oh, I've never written to a writer before, but I really loved your book and I thought you were writing my story. And so then they'll tell you their whole cricket journey. You know, I've probably had hundreds of them. And... It just shows how rich the game is, I think, in story and in literature. I mean, I read a lot of books um, as part of researching this novel. And a book like C.L.R. James' Beyond the Boundary, um, which is non-fiction, but it's one of the most beautifully written books I've ever read. I've, I've read it a couple of times and I will read it again. Recommend it to everyone. They're going, oh, cricket. I'm like, no, 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 just trust me. This is a beautiful book. Yeah, yeah, it, that's right. Yeah, which is about more than cricket, which any good cricket novel, or surfing novel, is about so much more. It's just about life. Jock, <clears throat> the rules of backyard cricket, um, did that need cricket to exist? Could the Keefe brothers have been the Keefe brothers with that story, with that relationship, if, if that background was uh, football or if they were mechanics or, you know, dare I say, if they were musicians? Yeah, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, it's only brothers and it's only cricket because I was one of four brothers and I played a lot of cricket. Um, so I felt like that was a world within which to situate that idea. And the idea was about how um, a young athlete, and, and they are typically male because of a set of dynamics, um, a young athlete is told at 14, you're going to be a star and people are going to pick up after you all the way through. All you have to do is hit the ball, chase the ball, do the ball thing. Um, and that was the point. I didn't know much about footy or cycling or a million other sports, but I knew cricket and I knew it could work that way. Um, and, and I think it started from watching that moment that we've all seen on the news when the athlete, and again, it's always going to be a bloke, has disgraced themselves on the Saturday night and they're at a table and there's a white tablecloth and the sponsor's soft drink and the welfare manager and the coach and the bloke will be saying, if I've offended anybody, I'm deeply sorry and <laughs> please respect my family's privacy at this difficult time. Um, and I wanted to know what's behind that curtain behind them 
how that moment got arrived at, you know? And that's, that's all sports. And again, it's this notion of learning all the disciplines of the sport and essentially growing up as a person but never learning accountability until the day your knee blows out or you get sacked or whatever the case may be and you have to live like the rest of us schmucks. And that was kind of the point. So you're right, it's, it didn't need to be cricket at all. Um, Inga, when, when I was travelling with the Australian cricket team, there was one reader in the team who, who read novels, uh, and that was Stuart McGill. Um, <laughs> we spent some time in a boot. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the other uh, really kind of cultured, interesting person um, I found in that team was Michael Slater. Um, does this say more about uh, me and uh, <laughs> writing than it does about cricketers? What do you mean? <laughs> well, they've used their imagination in different ways uh, post-career uh, too. I won't leave you to answer that. Um, I was trying to think of sports novels and, and, and novelists who'd, who'd written um, uh, on themes involving sport as well as you two. Uh, there's Rob Drew, of course, who was, was meant to uh, be with us today. Uh, Lloyd Jones, the New Zealand author, Philip Roth, um, uh, English author David Peace, uh, Kim Nunn and David Foster Wallace, the Americans Joseph O'Neill, uh, Shehan Karuna Tilaka um, and Aravind Adiga um, have both written uh, novels around cricket. One thing in common that they all have, uh, and here's a hint, you're the odd one out, uh, they're all blokes. <laughs> but do you think that's part of the part of the cultural barrier there? Uh, until more women are, are treating this field as something respectable and worthy of fiction, uh, that barrier is not going to break down. Yeah, maybe that that will make a difference. Um, I don't know. I mean, is the culture? Although I've said the women's the culture with the women's cricket team is is different. I wonder if they read any more books than the men's team do, um, let alone write them. Um, why, why don't more commentators write novels? You know, we locked into this idea of reporting the sport, reporting on what actually happened. When I went on um, Cricket Etc. with Gideon Haig and Peter Layla, um, it, it was a pretty awful podcast recording because my internet it happened to be a day where the wind, there was a high wind which for some reason that Telstra cannot explain means that my internet drops in and out. And um, so I kept dropping out, so it was a really interrupted conversation. But um, Peter O'Gideon asked, you know, about who I wrote the book for and uh, was I worried about how it would, receive, would be received or something like that. And I said, oh, yeah, I was terrified. Um, of it being read by guys like you, <laughs> which they were hysterical about for some reason. But um, yeah, that then they joked for some time while I was off air, um, when I listened to it later, um, about, oh, it must be nice just being able to make everything up. You know, how e you know, saying how easy, suggesting it was easy to make up matches. You know, it's actually nothing harder than to make up a cricket match and think of all the bits and pieces. Um, and create some tension and so on. So yeah, do you know what I mean? I think Hansi Kronje managed to do it, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> he made it a fiction, yes. He did make, um, with match fixing is the allegation. But do you know what I mean? That um, most people involved in the game, either playing it or reporting on it, perhaps are just too locked into, you know, the facts. are limited by what they know too, you know, by reality. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, which is the fiction, non-fiction schism. And a um, particular book I had in mind was, was a horse racing book by the American writer Laura Hillenbrand uh, called Sea Biscuit. And Sea Biscuit was a horse back in the, uh, I don't know, 19, the World War One era in the USA. And of course, nobody knew about Sea Biscuit, totally forgotten uh, horse. So she was able to tell the non-fiction story to an audience that didn't know what was going to happen next. Um, Non-fiction authors sometimes have, sometimes don't have that advantage. 
fiction writers, I guess, always have that advantage of the reader not knowing what's going to happen next. But then what, what burden does that place upon you to, to generate suspense where the reader doesn't know what's going to happen, but also, you, you, you know, may not care as much what's going to happen? Where, where does the care factor come from in fiction? It's probably different with every book. Um, you know, there's, does your player do well, you know, and what happens to their career? So I guess in this, in Willow Man's case, yeah, what does, does Todd Harrow, is he going to fulfil his dreams? Is he going to get to play for Australia? And if he does, will he play well? Um, yeah, then the same for Liv, who's playing alongside him. Uh, what, what will be her trajectory? if you like, with the game, where will it take her? Um, and how are the two, you know, we see sibling rival rivalry in sport. Until recently, that's between, been between brothers, usually. Or, and now there's a brother and sister. So I played with that a lot. Um, yeah, that's the trajectory of sport, isn't it? I mean, is your team going to win? Or is your player that you follow going to win or do well? But uh, what became interesting about Willow Man, given I'm writing with Philip Hughes in the background, that, and, and it was almost accidental, that it created this tension in the book um, because most people did know, do know what happened to Philip Hughes, that he died after being hit in the head. So you don't have to, you know, an opening batter is facing the new ball, it's a very hard ball, fast ball in um, first grade cricket. So international cricket. So that tension was there for me, people knowing that. Like, am I, people picked up on the similarities between the players and their, their careers initially. So th that was interesting, which I didn't realise until people started reporting back on having read it. Like, oh my God, I just couldn't, you know. What are you, are you gonna kill him off, <laughs> you know? <laughs> which is an interesting case where knowledge does create of what can happen to a player, certainly. Um, how you can use that tension in the narrative, I guess. We're going to ask for your questions um, uh, very shortly, so um, come off the long run, if you like, and uh, <laughs> uh, uh, wind up. Um, Inga, have you spoken to readers who've, who've read the book twice or multiple times yet, other than um, your editorial colleagues? Uh, because I'm wondering if they know the outcome, of course, Anyone who's read a book twice knows the outcome, but with a, a novel about sport, have you spoken to people who know the sporting outcome before they begin reading again? Yeah, only a few. Um, I have a real cricket nuffy friend who's yeah read a draft and then um, like you, Malcolm, and then yeah read the final thing, and and that's always nice because they yeah pick up on a bit more of what you were trying to do without being so focused on A, what's going to happen to Harrow or the Harrows um, and yeah, w are you going to kill him off? Um, is he going to get hurt? Um, so yeah, not enough maybe to get a measure, measure of that. Um, it's gratifying of course when someone reads a book twice. Do you think Going back to what you were saying about, uh, you know, those, those sports writers, Gideon and Peter, that you were talking to, the temptation for a novelist is, um, in a way, to, to control the outcome. And an, a novelist can, through maybe not the first draft, but through subsequent drafting, uh, <laughs> achieve a fantasy of total control. Yeah, absolutely, which you don't get while you're watching the game, that's for sure. You know, they never quite deliver exactly what you want. Um, as individuals or as a team, you know, they might for a bit and then they, they don't. So, yeah, there was a great pleasure in that, being able to manipulate the narrative and um, to, yeah, get the outcomes that I wanted. Or I'm just talking in football speak now, aren't I? Outcomes, <laughs> transparent outcomes. Um, yeah, to say what I wanted to say, to have the stories ring true for me, you know, within the novel rather than, um, you know, within the sporting tradition. But it is interesting, so the cricket 
fanatics are the ones who've been most critical of the book, you know, just reading it to find fault, which is not what you want as a storyteller, <laughs> you know, trawling through it to go, ah, she's never been to Cape Town, because if she had, she'd know that's a distillery or whatever, a, a brewery, those silos or whatever. Yeah. Um, so, um, I'm not sure what I want to say about that, but it, it is... Um, a limitation, even I as a writer felt limited by what I knew, you know, knowing about Sandpaper Gate, but not wanting to retell that. Um, knowing that I was painting a fairly glossy picture of the Australian cricket team and of a player. Um, having, yeah, there's some choices to make there about what I do for my own ends and how accurately I try and reflect on cricket today. Yeah. Uh, any questions yet? Up. Uh, okay. I enjoyed your um, contrast between the culture of women's and men's cricket and for me the, the lovely culture of the women's game has drawn me into it very fast. Um, so I'm just wondering are you going to continue to explore that um, because I was also interested in the question about is it going to change? Is the women's culture going to change and become more like the men's over time? Are you, you something you're going to follow? And explore? Yeah, I mean, it probably will change. Um, it's just a matter of how much. Yeah, no, I, st I absolutely still follow. Um, yeah, my, my frustration, as I suggested, was not enough test matches. I, if I don't watch women's cricket as much, it's because I don't like the short forms of the game as much. I really like that. Um, played over the five games and a multi-test series that really, um, you know, it is a t true test uh, of endurance of individuals and a team over time and their skills. It's rare that the better team doesn't win over a several test series. So that's my only frustration with the women's game. And... Um, you know, it's also the other notable thing about the women's, Australian women's team is that the, there's more diversity in that team than there is in the men's, yeah. Oh, right at the back. Uh, just to your point about people wanting to tell you how much they don't like cricket or sport, I found that a lot as well. And, and I've always wondered why the people are so vocal and so happy to tell you they don't like sport. Do you think it could come to the fact that as youth growing up it's kind of force, forced on people? Sport at school, there's sort of like, you know, it's the religion here we say, or do you think there might be some sort of trauma in those type of responses? <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. their opportunity to get, hey, oh, I really hate it. Because people who don't like sport are really vocal about telling you they don't like it, much more than they would about other things, like pumpkin or broccoli or something. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a great point and perhaps you're right, perhaps the majority of writers aren't, just aren't sporty and had terrible, um, a terrible time at school. <laughs> yeah, I agree, I, I think about the sports that I love and I think how can people be like that about sport? But then I think about the sports I detest <laughs> and I get it. It's, yeah. yeah, I got forced to watch golf last night for a minute or two. And... <laughs> um, in, in a you know, highfalutin sense, Patrick White made the same uh, argument, which is that sport, sport was such a cultural juggernaut in Australia, and Australians um, seem to identify themselves so much with with sporting success and sporting heroes that it was the role of the arts to to you know fight that and and try to undermine it from a from a trailing position, if you like. Yeah, I mean, and to be fair, I joked about my friend at a dinner party and I did get up and leave one of the dinner parties because I was just so offended. Um, but she, that person is an environmentalist and um, her partner is a scientist. So that, they would object to the amount of money that is, is put into sport compared to the, our, you know, protecting our environment or the arts for that matter. <laughs> um, yeah, or our scientists and the um, you know incredible work that they're doing on the on the front line. That this doesn't get any media attention, it doesn't get any money, but you know sport gets obscene amounts of money. Yeah, so, yeah I like the trauma theory. Thank you. <laughs> uh, on the left here. Um, I just wanted to. Um, 
perhaps ask if the problem is lack of diversity in the commentators when it comes to sport. So, Jock, have you ever thought of being a commentator? Because then if we added the artistic appreciation to sport, then people might start to see that there's more of a connection. Because I always remember, well, probably it was in the 80s or 90s, watching Rugby Union and watching the Ella brothers as they, they swept down the field and coordinated with each other so well and just performed it as though it was some fantastic dance. Um, it was just such a joy to watch their skills and yet it was never spoken about as such. It, was, it, it seems as though they want, they want to keep commentators who commentate on the actuality of the sport without talking about the beauty of the skills of the players, etc. So I was just wondering if perhaps we need that diversity in commentators and maybe we should have some writers putting themselves forward to do some commentary. <laughs> I secretly hoped that with Will Man I would get a guest stint, you know, on television commentary. I'm pretty disappointed that I haven't. Um, yeah, one of the Fox commentators read the book and, and mentioned it on New Year's, the, the evening broadcast of a T20 game on New Year's Day, actually, mentioned it. Um, didn't say my name, so I messaged him immediately and said, oh, thanks, Howie. Uh, maybe next time mention the author's name, which he did after the interval. Um, did the Ella brothers play for Parramatta? No. Who'd they play for? Um, it was a lovely description. I feel description. like such a Victorian right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was a lovely description and it's a good point. You know, it, perhaps there is a, um, an aversion to describing the beauty of the game in like a macho sport like football, describing it. Yeah. I, I do think that can also be overcooked. I, I don't know what you think, Malcolm, but I... In the latter years of Peter Roebuck, every test match had to be about the siege of Troy. <laughs> and so, mate, you know, again, so, we come back to they are chasing a ball. So too literary. <laughs> it's probably a happy medium somewhere, I think. Uh, I couldn't possibly comment, but the, um, the, uh, the kind of diversity um, I'm looking for to answer your question is uh, Fox commentator Isha Guha, um, who's, a, who's a fantastic commentator, I think it's down to, to their directors to say, Ishigua was an international cricketer, okay? Why is she in the role of always asking Mark War a question? I, I think we'll, we'll achieve um, diversity or, or equality or balance and open ourselves to, to um, uh, the avenues that you're talking about when we hear Mark Waugh asking Ishiguha questions. And does that mean that that exchange of questioner and answerer is mimicking conversational forms outside the commentary box exactly. that also need to change? Exactly. And yeah. her brain is twice the size of anyone else's in the yeah. commentary box. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to hear what she, what, yeah. what she thinks. No, she's brilliant. She's changed common yeah. commentary. Yeah. Um, Shane Warne, for all of his visible faults, would would, tr would try to deflect back to Isha. Yeah. I didn't know Shane Warne had any faults. Um, <laughs> you had a question there. Uh, yeah. Um, and it, it may, be, may be a bit trivial, but um, uh, throughout the, your noveling, uh, uh, the main character, t or one of the main characters, Todd, um, we never really got to find out whether he's a left or a right hand bat. I did. I don't think his favourite batsman was, was Damien Martin, who was a beautiful right-hand bat. And mostly people uh, aspire to be a left or a right-hand batsman if that's what they are, uh, with their through the hero. And but it, was he a left hand or a right-hand bat? I know Philip Pierce was. You found me out. I couldn't really decide, and I've never played the game. You have to know this. I've never played the game. And then this is one of the moments where and maybe it shows. Play, you, you, you want that visual yeah. Thing. Yeah. I probably wanted him to be a left-handed player, but I'm right-handed, yeah. Hey, could I also say in response to that that um, when I did backyard cricket, it has all these elaborate scenes in the backyard where there's a holly bush and there's an outdoor toilet and there's a clothesline and a concrete swan and all of those things represent fielding positions and I had it all mapped out in my head and I'd written all these scenes and it went to my editor, Mandy Brett, 
and she came back with reams of corrections and a diagram of this imaginary backyard and the fielding positions. And she said, that's not square leg, that's backward square, or possibly even, <laughs> possibly even a broad fine leg. And I wrote back to her and said, I had no idea you were a cricketer. And she said, I'm not, I'm an editor. <laughs> My editor did not draw that diagram. <laughs> uh, we've, I think we've got time for one more question. Over. Um, Jock, fellow pies man here, good run uh, and win last night. Um, just had a question for the panel actually. Um, in terms of professionalism of women's sport and going forward, um, who do you think should have the responsibility for really guiding that and making sure that women eventually get to that level playing field in terms of um, remuneration, um, uh, being able to access the media in equal, as, to some level of, level of equality, that's all. I think that can be answered pretty directly in respect of surfing, that if you drive through Torquay, there are giant light boards above all of the big brands and um, the men will be surfing and the women will be, you'll be looking at an ass. And um, unless and until sponsors change their depiction of the athletes, we're back where we started. Um, it's, it's so easy in surfing that, that on the one hand, women are being offered as visual objects and men are being offered as athletes. And despite having reached pay parity, um, that, that idea of depiction doesn't change. Um, I mean, with cricket, Cricket Australia has a massive role to play. But is it different in football because it is it each individual club and how they manage the image of their players and what you know who they let be sponsors and that sort of thing is it different to cricket yes because it's 18 separate corporations in effect i suppose and each of them has an ethos where cricket is really all funneled towards one point isn't it mm. yeah i mean so cricket australia has this huge role to play whether they do it <laughs> well or not is um yeah always a question um, I, I think cricket, at least, um, has always been a, a commercial uh, enterprise and commercial forces uh, decide everything ultimately and the commercial uh, centre of gravity in cricket is in India. So as the Indian cricket audience um, makes advances, which it is very quickly in terms of uh, um, interest in the Indian women's team and uh, women's T20 cricket, growing there, that, that gives us um, real uh, reason for hope, to answer your question. Um, okay, we're, we've been, <laughs> we're, we're given the wind up. Um, I, I'm sure we could, uh, as you understand, continue for eight, maybe for five days uh, <laughs> w without a result. <laughs> for now, would you please thank Inga Simpson and Jock Sarong.